Suzanne Lucas is better known as the evil HR lady. She spent 10 years in corporate HR where she was in charge of hiring, firing, and managing the numbers, and she also very carefully checked with the lawyers. She left the corporate world to advise people and companies on how to have the best human resources departments possible. Suzanne integrates best practices with innovative ideas and, yes, humor, including using improv comedy as a tool for leadership development. And I feel like, Suzanne, I should start off by asking you, if you could have any job in the world, what would it be? Oh, goodness gracious. I would love to do full-time training of people to use improv comedy for leadership development. Really, that's what I would do. And I already knew that answer, and I knew you would enjoy giving it, which is why I asked it. <laughs> but we all have to have a dream job, right? Mine is to be a travel blogger. Ooh, so no, that would not be a bad, I could take that dream job too. Hey, let's dive in. Today, we are talking about navigating the job market after a divorce and a career gap. And I know that you work with a lot of women in particular who are re-entering the workforce, and that can be really scary. Can you tell me some of the things that you work with them on as they're navigating this? Well, the first thing that you have to overcome is, especially when you've been out of the workforce and now you're forced back into it because of a divorce situation, which is very different from, okay, my kids are now in school. I think I'd like to go back to work. Um, when you're forced into it, which is the situation with a lot of divorces, you're in this panic and your self-esteem tends to be at about negative 412, right? Um, you had this plan, you had planned out with your husband that you were gonna be a stay-at-home mom, and now suddenly you've got to do this, and the courts are not terribly favorable to stay-at-home moms, and you might get alimony for a little bit, but you gotta get going. And so the first thing we have to deal with is helping someone realize that yeah, you are a capable person. You can go and do this. You don't have to be in a miserable dead end job for your entire life. You may have to take one today, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be stuck that way forever and that you have skills uh, that a 22 year old doesn't have. Uh, even though you're like, oh, I don't have any work skills, but you have things that that somebody young doesn't have and we don't go into a panic mode when we graduate from college and say i'm never going to be able to get a job but a 40 year old mother of three goes through this panic thinking i'll never be worth anything and that's the first thing we got to address well what i see on the financial side is there are some situations where that 40 year old with the three kids is not forced to go back to work for whatever reason, and does receive enough child support and alimony to cover all the bills and live reasonably comfortably. But I always say to them, you don't know what might happen that would put a stop to the alimony and the child support. What if your ex loses a job? What if your ex intentionally quits a job? Oh, great. We can go back to court and the court can tell him, you have to pay up. Go get a job and pay up. But if he refuses to get a job, there's going to be a period of time where you don't have income. And so even if the court isn't forcing you to go back to work, I always ask people in the process of divorce to consider going back to work because that is your security. Your paycheck is your security that there will always be food on the table. And that's a really important thing um, in, in taking control of your own life. And I think so often people feel like life happens to them. Just like, I am just on this for the ride and things happen. But it turns out that you are an active participant and you can do things to make your life better or worse. And, you know, one of my favorite sayings comes from a friend of mine, which is the, the man you married is not the man you're divorcing. And so you say, yes. um, oh, but he promised he's always going to support me and the kids. And this happens over and over and over again. Like you said, he quits his job or he gets remarried and starts a new family. And he doesn't care about you and the kids anymore. 
And um, a lot of times, I think you probably deal with a higher end demographic because you're dealing with a, a um, with going through accounting of these big forensic accounting deals that normal normal people don't have that type of thing. Whereas I'm dealing with people where there's not a ton of money. If if the husband is making seventy thousand dollars a year, that's enough to support a family altogether, but it's not enough to support two households. And so um, it's it's really going to be important, and it's really important for you to take control of your own life and not depend on money from him. Because, like you said, the court can order it, but if there is, you can't get blood from a stone, right? If he refuses to pay, the state right. doesn't step in and give you the money. No. And and so the only guarantee you have is your own actions. So if you go out and get your own job to at least ensure a certain amount of money is coming into the household, that's important. What do you see as some of the most common emotions that that stay-at-home mom is experiencing as she is in a position of going back into the workforce and getting started in this process? First of all, it's imposter syndrome all over the place. Um, for whatever reason, we believe, and this is something that I believed, you know, that other people know what they're doing and how to do it, right? Nobody uh, knows what they're doing. Nobody. nobody knows what they're doing. Nobody knows. And so, but there's this perception that everybody else knows how to do it. No, they don't. All of us are flying by the seat of our pants. And, you know, there are some things that we know how to do, right? But, but we didn't know how to do it when we started doing it. And so we have to get over this idea that everybody else knows what's happening and how to do it and that you can do it. So that's the first real big thing in this emotion. Um, and then when you're dealing with someone that's in the process of divorce or freshly divorced, divorces don't happen because, oh, you know what? I really like to move on. Oh yeah, me too. Okay, great. We're going to be besties. I mean, that's how it is always on television shows. Like we're going to still work together and run this business together. No, there's all this animosity and, and, and hatred. So you're in this panic mode. You're trying to protect yourself. You're trying to protect your kids and you don't know how am I going to balance kids and a job? I mean, that's a really tough thing as a single parent. It's hard with two parents working because kids, they're, they're unpredictable, right? Well, and for the benefit of our audience, you are a single mom who is divorced, who has essentially no help with your kids. Um, and so you are having to manage these appointments and everything alongside of working full time. So one of the reasons why I wanted to talk with you about this topic is A, you've coached so many women who are going back into the workforce, but B, you have personal experience with ramping back up in your career after being a stay at home and, and navigating what it's like to work and have the kids at the same time. Is there discrimination against stay at home moms when they're trying to get back into the workforce? Um, I hate to say it, but yes. And one of the mistakes I see people making is trying to tout the single mom thing as a reason why you should hire me. And that's not a good reason to hire and will hurt you. So how would you have them talk about this gap in their employment or this status as a stay at home mom? Because they're even if they're not asked directly about it, they're going to be indirectly asked about it or or they're going to be judged about it, right? They're going to be judged about it. And any employment gap, I mean, people are unemployed for just a few reasons. One is their stay-at-home mom or dad. There are some stay-at-home dads too. I know several of them. Um, two, they've had some health problem, either themselves or a family member that they're taking care of. Three, they got laid off and have been unable to find a new job. Or four, they suck. All right, those are the those are the reasons why people are unemployed. There's not really another reason. Um, and everybody interviewing already knows those reasons. And you can't hide that you've had time off. Like people are always trying to make their you know PTA membership a full time job. What well, we know that we we know it's not. Um, so, 
it's going to be this bias against you. But the key is you have to address it head on and you don't blame things on it. Don't tell me in an interview, I've got to go back to work because I just got divorced and I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. And it's really compassionate, right? You're trying to evoke compassion and that may be what you're feeling, but that's not going to help you get a job. The answer is, you know, I've been home taking care of my kids and I am ready to go back to the workforce. And in the interview, in the screen, you don't bring up the, I don't know how I'm going to pay for daycare. I don't know how I'm going to find someone. Don't bring any of that up in the interview. Save that until after you've got the offer, right? Um, and if you're in an area where there isn't a lot of daycare options, put yourself on the waiting list now, so that when you do get the job, you have options, right? Because there are some times where those waiting lists can be a long period of time. Um, and then there's also the option to look for more non-traditional roles. And of course, everybody wants to work from home. But for the love of Pete, don't say, well, I've got kids, so I need to work from home. No! No, 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 no. Working from home means working from home. If your child needs daycare, they still need daycare when you are working from home. I'm interviewing you for a job. You're coming back to work after a 10-year gap. You've told me that you've been a stay-at-home mom and you're excited and ready to get back into the workforce. Um, would you, at that time, would you recommend talking about all of the skills you've developed as a stay-at-home mom because you had to manage schedules and do all sorts of things, being CEO of the household, would you shy away from that discussion? How would you, would you talk more about being a stay-at-home mom or not? I would not, and here's why. First of all, uh, the person doing a screening interview is most of the time going to be female. Most recruiters are female, okay? So that person is a woman who probably has children of her own. And so when you start talking about, oh, I managed the household and I was the family CEO and I did the budget and I paid the bills, whoop de do so is she. She's doing that too on top of a full-time job. So it makes you sound naive. Like, and, and I'm not saying that that stuff isn't hard. It is hard. And the thing I want most is a wife to take care of all the stuff that I took care of when I was a stay-at-home mom. Wouldn't that be great to have someone that does that? It is a lot of stuff, but the person interviewing you is also doing it. If it is a man, I'm speaking in stereotypes here, the man probably has a wife that takes care of all that stuff. And so he devalues that, right? And even if she works full-time, she's still taking care of all of that stuff. He's not taking the kids to the pediatrician. He's not organizing play dates. He is not making cupcakes for a school party. He's not doing that in most situations. You know, if your husband's doing that, fantastic, good on him, but most are not. Um, and we could talk about why that is, but that's a different topic. It's just the reality that we're dealing with. So your male interviewer is devaluing that work because if he doesn't devalue it, then he has to come to terms with the fact that he's screwing his wife over who is also working full time. If it's a female interviewer, she's already doing that and she knows she's not special. It's not making you special, okay? Because most people have kids um, and, and everybody, kids or not, has to pay bills and manage budgets and all that crap that we all do. So no, if you have done volunteer work that is professional volunteer work, then by all means, talk about that. So if you are in the PTA as the treasurer and you've been balancing things and you've been running a fundraiser, that's professional work. If you are applying to be a a uh, you know daycare teacher, then yes, by all means, talk about the parties you planned and the kids stuff that you've done. But if you are applying to be even you know a grocery store cashier or an entry level marketing person, talking about the cupcake bake sale, it just makes you look naive. Think of yourself more as a new college grad. 
and they don't have any experience either. Um, and this is something that you can do as well. Right now, there is a million things, there are a million things online for free, right? You can take training classes on something. You can, and, and you can say, look, you know, I haven't worked for a long time, but I just completed this um, Udemy or Udemy, I don't know how you're supposed to say it, um, course on marketing or whatever it is that you're trying to get in. This is what I've learned. This is how I think I can apply it to your business. One of the key things in getting a job is instead of saying, what can you do for me? Say, here's what I can do for you. And a lot of times people flip that and they're like, I'm interested in this job because it's got a flexible schedule. It's hybrid. So I can be home three days at work. Yeah, great. But that's not why I want to hire you. I want to hire you because well, of what you do for me. And I don't think, I'm not an HR professional, I'm not a hiring manager, but I don't think someone coming to me saying, I want your job because I want flexibility and I want, I want, I want, I don't think that's an attractive person to hire. It's not, it's not. And so focus on what you can do, what you can bring. And there is some great things that come with maturity, right? Um, most of us, as we get a little bit older, we're not going to go out with our friends clubbing and get drunk and come over hungover. Um, we are going to show up when we say we're going to show up because we've gained that maturity level. Um, those things are very, very valuable, especially in entry level. And right now, there is a huge market for hospitality, retail, restaurants, and manufacturing. And a lot of women count themselves out of the manufacturing role because there's stereotypes that's a male thing. You go to the factory, right? That's a man's role. Yeah, but no, they are not. paying sign-on bonuses because they're so desperate. They're giving thousands of dollars for you to sign up for an entry-level position. And these entry-level positions are paying well. I'm seeing them paying 20, 25, 30 dollars an hour for no skills required. They just want someone who's going to show up reliably. Exactly, exactly. So don't get caught in that stereotype of, well, I can't do that. Um, I better go apply to be a waitress, although you can make great money waitressing. It's if you're at the right restaurant, you can, you yes. can race it. In. But um, Denny's probably not so much, but um, the right restaurant, you really can rake it in. But look at that. Look at those manufacturing things. Look at opportunities like that. And the thing is, is that you can move up. The job you take today is not the job that you're going to have in five years. And you may not know what that is. And, you know, back in the day when, when I was young, and had no children. I worked in HR for a grocery store chain and we hired a ton of stay-at-home moms. It was their first job going back. And as a grocery store, we were able to work around their schedule because a lot of the jobs were filled by teenagers, but they can't work during the school day. So that was perfect, right? You work during the school day while your kids are in school. And you know who was getting promoted rapidly? It was those women, right? Awesome. They were the ones that after six months, we were like, hey, maybe you should apply for this team lead role um, because they had all of those skills that you just develop as an adult, right? That you just realize that the world doesn't revolve around you. Um, you know, I, I, I always say the test of adulthood is when someone throws a potluck and you bring a dish. Like, yes. that's when, yes. when you realize, oh, yes. I have to bring a dish, you know, and we just all develop that as adults and, or hopefully, or you're the people that really suck. And that's another category of people. Um, so don't worry that taking this job at the grocery store or taking a job at McDonald's. I know a woman who ended up in this situation. She had to go back. The only job she could find was at McDonald's. Within two years, she was managing the whole store and it was a great job with benefits and all of that stuff. Do it. So let's suppose someone is trying to get a white collar type of job. Um, they've had job experience in the past, but again, maybe had that five or 10 year gap in the 
resume and they're in the job interview. And one of the questions, uh, the ways that they get questioned a lot of time is, tell me about a time when, and they present you with some sort of problem and you're supposed to come up with, well, this happened and I was the hero. And you haven't worked for 10 or more years. How would you suggest answering a question like that? Well, the first thing that you need to do is you need to work through well, how you're going to answer those questions because you're right, those are going to come up. And there is a, a formula for answering those tell me about a time questions and that's where you present a situation, a task, um, the action you took and the result from that. It's called the STAR method. Um, it's one of the methods I teach in my um, interview workshops. And so you plan in advance. So figure out how are you going to answer that? What is a situation where you had a difficult situation? You can use your conflict with the school principal uh, for that. You just need to, to put it into those terms. You can also go back to pull from your previous work experience. Um, just plan ahead. You're going to be asked those questions. And that is one thing that you can Google right now, um, popular interview questions, and you'll get a list. And most of the people interviewing you are crappy interviewers. They are Googling the same thing. Okay. So let's pretend I'm that stay at home mom going back into the workforce and, um, I've gotten a job offer first job offer I'm getting, should I take it or should I hold out for something better? It depends. Um, <laughs> not knowing the offer, I don't know. Um, but what you should do is try to negotiate an increase in salary. Just because they don't offer you one doesn't mean that you're being lowballed. Um, I, but when I was hiring, I never negotiated salaries. I would give the highest and best offer first. And in a lot of companies, though, they don't offer highest and best. They expect you to. Um, and that's really going to depend on the job. You don't, if they're offering you $20 an hour and you say, well, I need 30. No, it's not going to happen. You are completely out of the realm of reality. They offer you 20. You say, how about 22? That's more realistic. They may come back with 21, right? That's, that's a really that's good That's how thing. the game is played. That's how the game is played, but it's not a red flag if they won't negotiate. Also, before you accept an offer, you want the benefits package. And there's a lot of entry-level roles that don't have any benefits with it. You need to be clear on that. And you also need to be clear on what that will do to you. If you're using um, Medicaid um, for your kids or yourself, um, what's going to happen when your income goes up, is it going to make you ineligible for that? Um, what is it going to look like on the marketplace? Um, you know, with the Affordable Care Act, um, what's that going to look like? Run those numbers to make sure that it is that. Now, a lot of people will be like, oh, it's not enough money and I'm practically losing money by the time I pay for daycare and health insurance and all that. Yes, that is true. But your kids are not always going to need daycare. And the work today allows you to do work better tomorrow. And you've got to start somewhere. Suzanne, evil HR lady, we have gone through so much really valuable information today. If people want to find you, where can they go? I am really easy to find. If you Google evil HR lady, I will pop up. Um, my website is evilhrlady.org. I am on Twitter at Real Evil HR Lady, and you can always send me an email at evilhrlady at gmail.com. It was so great having you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me on. Bye.